wait oh, a minute. I hit it. Hit it. Go. <laughs> In this episode of Hot Hardware is doing to have geeks. We're going to have G-Forces, Radeons, Snapdragons, and all kinds of fruity stuff next. <laughs> Welcome back to yet another fine episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, where we're a little twitchy today, and uh, Chris kind of gave me a surprise attack there on the tease, Chris. I'll get you for that, buddy. Yeah, you take a couple <laughs> weeks off, and you kind of forget how everything works. Sorry. <laughs> Normally, we do a countdown in the background yeah. as the lead-in that I yeah. just totally skipped past. Yeah, because so like, Marco made everybody late, as usual. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all you're all sabotaging me. Dang it. Hey, that's what are you gonna do? That's hey, what that's what friends are for, right? Someone's gotta make you look bad. That's it. Well, I think I'm pretty adept at that myself. Hey, so uh yeah, welcome back everybody. Good to see y'all. Um and uh, good to see my compatriots with me as always, the illustrious Marco Cipetta and the ever elusive Chris Getting. How are you guys doing? Doing doing good, can't complain. Hmm. Yeah, Chris, yeah. you're 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 elusive today. I called you elusive because yeah of what you did to me with the tease. I am, I am out there today, but it's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring it back. We'll blame we'll blame it on the uh, the uh, pandemic. That's what we'll do, and uh, and and go from there. Yeah. So Marco's been grinding. I've been grinding. It's it's been a busy busy Q4. Um, thank God it's almost done. Um, we're, we're warming up for CES, which is going to be virtual and digital and all kinds of not in person, unfortunately, by the way, you can get a beautiful room in Las Vegas, right on the strip for 36 bucks a night right now, usually like 3,600 a night, <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, just all kinds of stuff going on. And we've been, we've been a little bit, uh, it's, we skipped a week there cause, uh, we just had too much work to do. That's that's what it came down to. Productive. We needed to be productive. Not that this isn't, but you know, this is more fun than anything else, right, guys? Right, right, Marco. You having fun? Yes, yet? it's it's pure fun. That's it's all it could possibly be is fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, uh, what's new and exciting in your lab, your neck of the woods, right now? Before we dive in, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about the headlines and the reviews. But you got anything exciting going on? Anything brewing that uh, you can tease the folks out there? Brewing, yes. We just launched sixty nine hundred XT yesterday. MSI sent this little tiny thing. See if I can get that to focus. Oh baby, that is their uh, their Jeez. top of the line Supreme RTX thirty eighty. So this thing is is huge. Yeah, I actually had to. Um, remove the drive cage in my test rig because the card was too big. It's the first card for like, I want to say five or six years that I've been using these NZXT cases that I couldn't fit a GPU in there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that is a big honking graphics card. My goodness. Better yes. be powerful. That's all I can say. So that's a, that's an OEM 6,900 or 6,800. No, 3080, RTX 3080. Oh, it's a 3080. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I got, had Radeon on the brain there for a minute. Because I was going to show this. This is what I did today. Um, I, I did a bit of a transplant. Let me see if I can get it to focus here, too. Hmm, hang on. Yeah. Anyways, it's a Ryzen 9 5900, uh, 5950X box. It's not an Xbox. It's a Ryzen 9 5950X. And uh, I just got through transplanting that into the system that is powering my feed right now, my workstation. Uh, upgrade from a 3900X. And dang, it's pretty spiffy. I'm working on a video for that. So stay tuned. To You can see the, you can see the lobotomy I gave the machine, the brain transplant. And uh, actually, yeah, it wasn't a brain transplant. It was like a bionic implant of 16 cores of glory so yeah that'll be fun chris you got anything going on before we dive into the headlines um it's it's my main job keeping me busy right now uh so i haven't been able to play too much in the tech stuff though i did get myself a nice new 27 inch 1440p 144 hertz monitor from lg um so i've been enjoying that um Maybe I go. can spin a little review on it. We'll see. Because it's the it's the new 27GN850, um, which the GL850 was a very popular monitor, very high performance, very good color. 
um, and this is at least LG says it's the same panel, um, basically the same monitor just without the USB hub and you save a few bucks on it. So um, impressed with it so far. I, you know, LG makes great stuff. Uh, I have a 38 inch panel staring at me right now, um, which is a 175 Hertz with G sync. Um, beautiful IPS display. Yeah. Good stuff. 3860 by 1600 res on mine. Um, so, uh, let's dive in, shall we? Let's talk about the news real quick. We'll run down a couple of interesting tidbits, not, not so much the news, some, some feature stuff, um, interesting tidbits that, uh, you should check out when you get a chance. And then we'll dive into the, the deep dive stuff, uh, talking about LG's wing, the LG wing review, a solid 5g phone with a wild twist. Check that out. I'm going to drop a link in the chat now. Um, Chris, I don't know if you can bring that up, but it is a pretty wild phone. As you can see, uh, the display flips and twists and into a T they call it the wing. Um, I'm not sure what's wingy about it. It's kind of a wing in that shape, I guess. Right. Um, but wild Android from, from the folks at LG and, um, Miriam Joa did a review for us on this, found it compelling, found it like really, you know, kind of frivolous but also really cool and you're going to admire the thing it's huge as you can see as well marco any thoughts on that before we uh, move on from it just just dropping a tease on this one yeah pretty pretty interesting form factor i'd have to play with it like i can see it being cool if you're you know if you well nobody travels a lot now anymore but if you travel and you know you wanted to be able to answer emails on the lower display while you're consuming media on the top display i could see it being cool but other than that it just seems like a funky form factor when it's open but the cool thing is it only adds a couple of millimeters uh in width so i i don't know i'd have to experience it firsthand i, I can't make up my mind on that thing Hey, let's put mm. that in productivity terms. You can have your Zoom meeting on the top screen and take notes on the bottom screen. Then it's a work. There device. you go. There you go. There you go. You can justify it that way. Someone, someone's complaining that I need to start a, already in the chat. Uh, I need to start a GoFundMe for a camera. It, 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 is my, is my feed there? We bad? got Marco laughing. Uh, I know. I, I, so that that's my buddy Ray. And um, I, I, <laughs> Did I you... may have I may have bought another camera body and I'm testing oh. it right now. And oh. and Ray might be jealous of the one I'm testing. Oh. So he, he's messing with everybody. So okay. you're telling me it's you, an have inside a, joke. you have a new secret test camera that you haven't even told me about. Because it's it's I, another I thought, Olympus, and I don't want you guys to make fun of it. I thought there fun. was a connection. Oh God, you are <laughs> such a you're 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 now addicted. You're we've created a monster. It's, yeah, it's right. my fault. But yeah, fun fact, Dave and I are actually using the same camera, but yes, right. Um, but. It's it's Canon's USB limitations that are chopping yeah. us off. Yeah, DSLRs, we did up our visual game. So I was hoping that wasn't a shot at me, but it was more of a, a shot at Marco, I guess. And let's let's drop something else into the chat that you should check out. Hot Hardware's um, uh, 2020 DIY system guide by the illustrious Ben Funk does a fa fantastic job for us on this. Um, and uh, so recommendations on PC components um, that uh, hopefully you can acquire. Uh, if you're a do-it-yourself type, you want to build a new system, uh, we go through a good, better, best, and monster killer gaming rig configurations um, recommendation, kind of a menu list. Um, check that out. Good stuff. Um, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom on that, Marco, but, um, Ben usually does a great job and knows his stuff. Yeah. I, the, th the thing that strikes me this year is how much performance you can get for not a lot of money. Even mm. like the, the low end rigs, the $850 rigs, probably the sweet spot, yeah. but you can build like, I mean, if you could buy this stuff, let's be realistic. I know everybody's going to jump on us for having a build guide when you can't buy anything. It's not our fault. We still want to provide guidance to people that are considering a build. But like a top end gaming rig with a 3080 and a Ryzen 9 5900X, 2,500 bucks. That's awesome compared to what you used to be able to get for 2,500 bucks. So it's yeah. just, it's a great time to be a PC enthusiast in terms of what's uh, theoretically available when it's all on shelves, even better. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, absolutely. And there's some, there's some great 
great deals on uh, even things like laptops these days that are more accessible. Um, we had a deal post go up today that was pretty cool on a Lenovo laptop. Um, it was a Tiger Lake machine, 512 gig um, SSD, 12 gigs of RAM for like $650, you know, so fully decked out. I'll drop that in there. Um, lots of stuff, you know, going on sale for sure. Um, we did get a little bit of an inside. We'll have to talk about this when we get into the GPUs. We did get some inside baseball um, on why GPU shortages are where they are. A um, little bit of insight, a little bit of color. Um, not that it makes it any better, uh, changes anything, but at least some insight. All right, let's uh, let's move on with with that said, and uh, talk about uh, let's. Do we, we want to go into we want to go into mobile first, and then finish up strong on the PC side, or how do you want to do that, gents? Sure, let's do mobile first. All right, let's let's talk uh, let's talk Snapdragon eight eighty eight because that's some pretty cool stuff from our friends at uh, Qualcomm. Snapdragon eight eighty eight. Qualcomm had their annual Snapdragon Summit, and uh, unfortunately, this year it was not in beautiful Hawaii. We usually go to Maui to hang with the folks out there for Snapdragon Summit. Um, it was virtual. Actually, really cool event, I will say as well. They did a um, virtual conference center where you literally could walk around into different conference rooms they had a keynote room different track rooms really cool really well done um you know for for a digital venue um but yeah they announced the uh, snapdragon 888 5g it is a uh, a new high-end premium tier mobile um platform chipset platform uh, system on a chip and um it is, uh, you know, revamped with all kinds of new technologies, primary of which that sort of sticks out for me is the uh, ARM, um, oh, let's see, Cortex, what is it, X, X1, M1? Yep. Yeah, yeah, X1, Cortex X1, um, prime, you know, performance core. And then it has Cortex A78 um, uh, power cores as well, um, and then A A55 efficiency cores. So you've got one and three, so one Cortex X1 for super, um, you know, burst performance, and then three A78s for you know crunching through uh, multi-threaded workloads, and then A55s, a quartet of those, still an octal core design, but carved up in a one three four um, configuration. They are claiming <clears throat> with an with a new um, Adreno six sixty GPU, they are claiming twenty five percent better. CPU throughput, uh, 35% better GPU performance, I believe, and all kinds of uh, additional kickers for things like AI and machine learning, which is becoming more and more prevalent on the handset these days, whether you talk about uh, image processing, um, recommendation engines, recommenders, um, you know, whether it's Google or whoever um, you're talking to to get you know, your digital assistant. Um, really impressive stuff. Triple uh isp camera so now they've got uh, three image signal processors that can do some pretty amazing stuff on the imaging side 4k hdr video recording um 28 megapixel um triple photography and then they use that you know triple shot to um you know compile and uh i guess yeah process multiple exposures to give you better hdr performance so Really impressive stuff all around. Marco, your thoughts on this. And uh, we're hopefully going to be seeing some phones in Q1 in, in pretty short order in 2021. Yeah, one of the other real important developments, the integrated uh, X60 5G modem now, it's, it's now yep. on a single chip. Good catch, so yep. in addition to you know building them at five nanometer, in addition to the, I believe they claim up to 20% more power efficient, plus the integrated modem, it should be a really high performance chip and with better or equal battery life, you know, to phones we have now. I'm really looking forward to see what partners do. There's been some scuttlebutt of some partners not using the Snapdragon 888, but then, you know, benchmarks were leaking with those phones with the 888. So lots to uh, lots to figure out in the weeks ahead. I suspect we'll know more by like the mid-January CES MWC timeframes. But yeah, this is the chip that's going to be in basically every flagship phone in the U.S. next year. So cool stuff. Yeah, there's been some, there's been a few leaks of next generation Galaxy devices. I think it was, you know, everybody's calling it Galaxy S21, which would um, 
coincide with 2021 that makes sense um but um we're not sure what's powering that the the rumor is it is snapdragon based um there were some other rumors contrary to that that uh perhaps um you know samsung was going to be going full-on exynos no no snapdragon this time around i'd be surprised um but uh, we can't confirm or deny that either way, except that um, they're near. And so handset should be um, livening up real soon. Chris, any thoughts on the uh, on the Snapdragon, the Snappy Dragon? Um, it looks fast. I haven't had too much of a chance to dig into it, but I think the, the little departure from uh, the conventional big little with the three tiers of cores is interesting. So you kind of aren't all or nothing on that. Um, the extra mm. ISPs definitely should help a lot as computational photography really is the future. Um, so everything they can do to support that is is going to make for better results for anyone using their cameras, which is just about um, everyone with their phone. So uh, yeah. very, very good trends. They obviously uh, understand where the market is going. And I think I think we're going to have a good generation next year with these new phones. Yeah, yeah. I was I was pleased with the with the move to Cortex X1, which I believe was done to improve their single thread uh, performance and and responsiveness, general responsiveness of the phone. Um, it is the first time, the first commercial implementation of uh, an ARM Cortex X1 core. Um, so that's going to be interesting. I want to see how much they close the gap, frankly, with Apple um mm -hmm. in in some of the performance tests because that could be uh could be a differentiator um they've always had fairly strong multi-core um but single core is where they've where they've trailed and then of course it will be interesting to see the adreno 660 and how that performs on the uh, graphics side so good stuff i mean it, you know the, the triple camera array I'm, I'm also fascinated to see too you can do some pretty interesting stuff like 4k 120 fps slow-mo shooting they have a couple of demos showing that um really just up in the camera game i mean what you can do with a phone camera these days is just crazy it's great stuff so um yeah so that's the snapdragon 888 did i drop that in there yeah, no i, I didn't got you covered oh that a boy thank you sir yeah so <laughs> check that out um and coming soon i'm sure we'll be getting handsets from the usual suspects to uh to prove out the performance and the experience and all that good stuff and then we had another one that uh, is sort of on the mobile side, but um, an interesting uh, one before we dig into the to the GPUs we have coming up soon, Apple's M1 Silicon. Um, and Ben Funk is working on a review that we will have live tomorrow. The full detailed rundown with an Apple M1 Silicon powered Mac Mini. You're looking at it right there. It's just a little tease preview. And um, he actually, you know, basically just got into this machine from a from a you know the best comparison angle we could think of right now versus x86 solutions in the market, or and actually in the case of Qualcomm, another ARM solution in the market. Um, come to find out, there was an emulator um, that uh, not an emulator, yeah, uh, a uh, an emulator that's. Um, you know, available in the market to run Windows. Um, you know, a developer worked on it to run Windows 10 on Apple Silicon on the the Mac OS in a, a virtualized uh, environment, a Hyper-V environment, and we were able to compare and and look at Apple M1 Silicon performance uh, running Windows, and then compare it versus Intel Tiger Lake, and um, Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 CX, um, which is their uh, an ARM an ARM core design, obviously as well. Uh, but you've got Intel x86 and ARM, and everybody's running Windows. And here's what the performance looks like. Marco, thoughts? And and you know, I I think hopefully I explained how Ben was able to pull this testing off, getting Windows to run on the on the Mac, which you know th this new M1 Silicon, uh, you know Apple Silicon has done away with boot camp essentially. And so we had to do some some special tricks with emulation here. Yeah. So he uh, Ben grabbed the insider preview of the Windows on ARM build, the build that's on like the um the you know the uh, the Surface Pro X, and is running it in inside a virtual machine on the Mac. So right, um, it's not emulating; it's running inside a virtual machine. It's it's the Windows on ARM version 
running inside a virtual machine. And we should point out, we have a couple of numbers in this article that are really interesting, right? We, we show Windows 10 running on the Mac Mini crushing the, uh, the Galaxy Book S with yeah. the ACX in it. But it, it loses, obviously, well, not obviously, but it loses to a thin and light Dell XPS 2-in-1 in a couple of tests that we have here. Now, we have much more in-depth performance data coming in the full piece, but this is really interesting stuff, and uh, this is going to like probably freak Dave out a little bit. This is the first <laughs> time, I think, in the history of, of Apple that I've actually looked at what they're doing and think they they are going to really shake things up because the M1 is absolutely no joke. Yeah. And if the rumors are true that they are going to double the CPU cores and potentially quadruple the size of the GPU, man, they're going to have some killer, killer performance. You know, having everything completely in vert vertically integrated and building a chip designed for your software, not, a, you know, a generic instruction set for you know, a piece of so a software that has to run on many, many, many different pieces of hardware. It's it's a CPU and GPU built specifically for Apple's needs. And we're seeing what it can do. And it's, damn, it's impressive, man. I, yeah. I, I'm, I don't know, man. I think yeah. uh, Intel, AMD, everyone's got to step things up. <laughs> yep. No, I, I would agree. I, I was I was thoroughly impressed at at what, you know, at first we looked at, you know, the, the general cross-platform benchmarks that we could run on Apple Silicon, you know, you know, straight up, you know, in, 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 in Mac OS and then compare, you know, you know, kind of a quick, you know, quick and dirty sanity check on that. And then Ben went and went ahead and, and worked this out to get windows running on it. And yeah, I expected, you know, especially since, you know, M1, you know, as Apple Silicon is, is running in that virtualized, um, setup. Um, even though it's it's running Windows on ARM code for for the for the version of Windows, I still expected it to be you know hampered, ha hamstrung a little bit. No, <laughs> not so much. And you know, actually ran circles around the Qual uh, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 CX in the in the Samsung Galaxy Book S. Um, we know Qualcomm's working on a next generation um, Snapdragon chip for Windows devices for Windows on ARM. Um, I think. I think the HCX is getting a little bit long in the tooth now, and they probably get something based on this Snapdragon 888 architecture that's going to be more robust. But yeah, it is no joke. Uh, you know, we we kept poking holes at it, going, or trying to poke holes. You know, where's it going to fall down? Yeah, it hasn't fallen down yet. <laughs> yeah, you know, the spots where maybe the chip wouldn't have the raw throughput, it has an accelerator, you know, on there that can be leveraged. So it's man. <laughs> yeah I, yeah i'm like tempted to buy one just to you know mess with it and learn about it it's and it, that's not like me yeah yeah <laughs> well i mean i think we've all dogged apple for a long time about not innovating as much as they used to you know they haven't had quote unquote the iphone moment um you know that the original iphone had that really reshaped the landscape for 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 handsets and you know, we've been sort of, hey, you know, Apple's playing catch up, you know, oh, look, you know, this this Mac is still on Intel's last generation x86 and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, then we we knew that there was this effort to bring silicon design in house. Um, and, you know, we expected that 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 was going to be a probably a longer trail than it really was. And they are executing the heck out of this now, and it is impressive. And you got to hand it to them; they are innovating. Um, they are absolutely innovating again. Um, they did at first. We thought this this you know you know internal silicon design effort was almost purely for for profit for profit margin because obviously you can build it yourself. You're not relying on third party partners to do it. Uh, it's more profitable to do that. But really, we're looking at significant innovation as well, and that's what impresses me. Chris, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, they've been doing their chips for iPhone and iPad. They've been getting their experience there. It's not like they're really coming out of nowhere, but they're definitely putting uh, more power behind these chips. And I think it probably came to a point in their development where they said, yeah, we can do this and we're confident in it. Combining that with Intel stumbling on process nodes, maybe it didn't even need the stumbling. Maybe they were headed there anyway. 
with this, but I think it's definitely very promising what we're seeing with the M1. I think the potential is very strong there uh, for future products, at, even at the high end. Um, you know, they, they were very vague with their announcements, you know, claiming three, three and a half times performance, whatever, but not really noting numbers. And I don't know if that's fully played out yet, but it's very, very strong. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And when when you think about, you know, a Mac mini running Windows virtualized, you know, and and then showing up and being within striking distance of Intel's most current generation laptop architecture, um, Tiger Lake, it's it's pretty impressive. Now, granted, the Mac mini is a, um, you know, actively cooled machine. It's a it's a larger form factor. It has probably a little bit more thermal envelope than uh, a macbook does uh, especially a fanless macbook but um still it's not that much different than in this case dell's xps 13 2 and one which is also actively cooled but in a two and a half pound notebook so <clears throat> really interesting stuff um and and i'm looking forward to ben's full review which is going to go live tomorrow right uh, hopefully <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Oscar Castillo in the chat literally just made the point that I was going to make um, in our next segue. It's, you know, if you want to play devil's advocate with both Apple and the rest of the market, it, what was Intel doing for all those years to keep the, you know, the single thread performance just incrementally improving mm -hmm. while AMD was down? You know, perhaps if Intel was pedal to the metal, right. Apple wouldn't have been compelled to even do this. Right. You know, so it's possible someone inside Apple said, screw this. We're going to do it ourselves. You know, we're sick of waiting for X, Y, Z to happen. And bang, you know, they, they went to town and we have the M1. I, yeah, I, that, that could be part of it. Um, I think, you know, and, and, and I think Intel, um, you know, maybe the 10 nanometer misstep um, may have been a little bit more of an accelerant to it. But I also think this is a little bit of Tim Cook, or maybe a lot of Tim Cook, the operations guy, right? Um, once once job left, and everybody, you know, sort of, not everybody, but some folks sort of were critical of him as being the, uh, you know, more of a bean counter, more of a, hey, we, let's make it run profitable kind of guy, which, hey, any business, you need that. You're, you're serving, uh, you know, your shareholders uh, at the end of the day. But I, th I think it was a little bit more, at least started from that, no, we need to own more of the IP ourselves, build more of the IP ourselves, be, be beholden to fewer partners as much as we can. Um, and then, yeah, I think maybe, you know, the 10 nanometer missteps um, for Intel, it was, it was just sort of a catalyst to, to drive it, you know? entirely possible yeah yeah but yeah i mean heck who knows if we had if we had more competition you know back in the day uh maybe maybe the x86 solutions would have been enough to keep keep apple uh on the train but man you know they did it before it used to be that um uh it used to be that they were what was the motor power pc they were power pc i remember that shift back in the day i'm dating myself now but they can do it they're they're not afraid to you you're thinking they're they're going to rip up the entire code base here and they're going you know arm and they were x86 for so long and oh my god it's a herculean effort oh yeah they're already doing it <laughs> well they, they well they had the phone you know they had so many years with yeah. the iphone to yeah. tinker you know and um you know uh, blackhawk in the chat just made another interesting point and this is something else rolling around in the back of my head you know nvidia licenses arm tech to compete with apple yeah, i yeah. think if NVIDIA ends up with ARM, you see what Apple can do licensing the ARM instruction set. Mm. I think NVIDIA could do crazy things. Rush it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. It's going to get real interesting real soon. And, and you know, it's going to take, uh, you know, probably better part of a year from now uh, for that transaction to go through. Um, the NVIDIA ARM acquisition, if it goes through, I mean, it still needs to be, you know, blessed by regulatory bodies globally. Um, so that's a long, that's a long haul, but I have some confidence there. I think NVIDIA has got some pretty crack M and a folks that'll get that done, but man, yeah, it could get interesting. <laughs> and I also think as, as workloads move more and more to towards web-based solutions, 
Risk is more than capable of handling these versus the full x86 instruction set. So you can yeah. use ARM's advantages of being more power efficient, being more mobile first um, than the big iron x86 without really losing that user experience in most cases. Yeah, it used to be the risk versus CISC argument was was valid. And I'm yeah, sorry about ARM 60. Yeah, ARM 64 and all that. It's it's you get some pretty pretty big pretty, pretty big horsepower and certainly Apple has made a silicon bet on it. So, cool stuff. Good to see. Keeps guys like us busy. <laughs> we'll be we'll be we'll be uh we'll be looking at uh all kinds of ARM architectures in the future, I think if Nvidia has anything to say about it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to NVIDIA, actually, something NVIDIA. Uh, and then we'll finish up with uh, the 6900 XT. But let's talk about the GeForce RTX 3060 Ti. Um, Is this it? Yeah, man. Oh, you're going to get it? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to grab it, and I'm, I'm reaching back, but the, it was the 3070 in the stack. Uh, not the 3070. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm not going to grab it. All right, so <laughs> here it is. RTX, RTX 3060 Ti, there it is. That's the Founders Edition card. Really love that cooler design. Well done, NVIDIA. That is, that is my favorite cooler design, and since I can't remember one, just a great, great design. Um, <clears throat> interesting. Uh, let's see. Price point is, what is it, $399, right? Yes, well, MSRP is. Yep. MSRP, so if you say. can find it. Yeah, if you can find it. Um, let's see, 4,864 4, CUDA cores, 152 Tensor cores, 38 uh, RT cores. Um, and it's rocking basically the same core clock, 1665 megahertz versus 1650 as an RTX 2060 Super. Same 8 gigs of GDDR6 memory and 7,000 megahertz memory clock, same kind of bandwidth. 200 watt board power, so you've got a lot more CUDA cores firing here, over 2x that of an RTX 2060. For 399, is was that MSRP suggested for for 2060 back in the day? 2060 Super, I think it was. Yeah, for 2060 <clears throat> Super, yes, yes. And and this thing hangs with a 2080. Is mm -hmm. the is the claim? So, Marco, you you poured through all the numbers. Um, Man, seems like a winner in that price point. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we don't haven't heard anything from AMD in this price point with Big Navi or I should say RDNA two architecture. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> um, really great card. So, <clears throat> just to quickly summarize, come by the site to see all the benchmarks. But Dave <clears throat> summarized the performance properly. I, I got to test two cards. Right, one was the Founders Edition built by Nvidia, and one was the the MSI RTX 3060 uh, Gaming X Trio, a much bigger. Uh, OEM card and performance was very different between the two, right? So the gaming trio, um, higher clocks, much bigger, cooler can sustain cl higher clocks longer as well. And what you see is the two cards kind of sandwich the 2080 super, the founders editions about as fast, sometimes a little slower. Whereas the MSI card with its higher clocks and, and bigger cooler is right on top of it or a little faster more often than not so it really sandwiches the 2080 super mm. and i think that's the really interesting part of the story here right nvidia left something in the tank yeah and the oems are exploiting it and what does that mean moving forward because all of the boards are power limited right right out of the box so yeah it, we're gonna this it's just both these companies are playing chess with the gpu releases mm. and i I think I suspect that maybe we're going to see more releases sooner rather than later. And um, it's just going to be a crazy time to buy GPUs over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. Although we, we need to get a little something called substrates, um, <laughs> silicon substrates for GPU packages. Um, that's the problem. Yeah. I think right um, now the crazy thing is just buying a GPU. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's 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 what we were, I wanted to touch on real quick is the reason you can't acquire a GPU right now or the bottleneck, I should say, with respect to GPU availability. Uh, NVIDIA's CFO was on a um, earnings call and basically just said its substrates, our, our, our component uh, partners uh, were short in certain areas. Substrates are part of the issue. I think it's it's components in general, but... Um, there's some pretty high-end technology required for 
large GPUs like this, for, for graphics processors like this. They're complex designs. And yeah, uh, the substrate, <clears throat> which is, you know, that that vehicle that carries the, the GPU die and connects it to the PCB is just in short supply. Everybody's chewing them up. So... Yeah, we doesn't have make like it any better, but <laughs> the perfect the perfect crappy storm right now. You know, yeah. um, cryptocurrency is back on the rise, so the miners are back in the mix. We now have you know gaming is so huge that scalpers are now buying cards. So we also have component shortages, and the GPU guys have kick ass products top to bottom. So it's Everybody like wants them. yeah, stuff is just disappearing right away. You know, both AMD and Nvidia in you know representatives from the company live on our podcasts. Both said they had more stock for this generation than the previous, and they all still disappeared immediately. Mm. So it's just a crazy, crazy, crazy time. I think I read a story. I think it was for PlayStation still, but these damn scalpers um, made like forty-three million bucks on scalped PlayStation Fives. You know, wow. The, yeah. the, the e-tailers really have to find a way to limit this and prevent that kind of stuff from happening. I know you know it's a capitalist society. If you can make money, go for it, but. To, that's, you're literally punishing consumers that want this stuff, and th there should be something that can be done there. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And uh, what did, what did I hear? Like over in um, somewhere over in Asia, there was a truckload of GeForce cards that was yeah uh, MSI nineties MSI yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they're hijacking stuff now. <laughs> and things an are so, card things are so bad. Cards. <laughs> things are so bad that when that story hit. I saw comments. People thought that it was just BS to, you know, try to gain yeah. sympathy with it, with the community. Yeah. 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 No, it's tough. You know, we get it, you know, and, and, uh, but I, what I don't understand is like the anger, the, the vitriol towards the manufacturers, you know, crap launch, paper launch, blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, you can only affect what's in your control. And it seems like a lot of this isn't in their control. Maybe I I'm giving them ask, a pass too much. I don't know. I think you and I have just been around the block and we're not like the yeah. cynical mean guys with a hair across our butts like, you know, some of the younger <laughs> folks in the business. It's like at the bottom line, do you think these companies want to sell fewer or more cards? Right. Right. Of course they want to sell more. If they could yeah. have made them, they would have made them. If they had more, they're going to sell them. It's not some sort of scheme to hold them back. It's just... You know, market dynamics, it is what it is. It stinks. I understand everybody wants to buy this stuff. Um, but, you know, we just got to wait a little longer. And when the stuff is in stock, everyone's mm. going to be happy because, man, this is some nice hardware right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there there may be some dynamics about, you know, you, you can definitely reason away that data center GPUs drive a crap load more margin. And so it behooves NVIDIA to, you know, drive more availability towards those. Um, but the, when you run a business, you, you have you have verticals of customers that are drastically different. And when you look at a data center customer versus a consumer GPU, they're they're all very important. They all drive um, market share, presence, um, you know, uh, brand brand awareness. You, you know, there's there's intrinsic value regardless, and you have to. It's a balance. So I think it's probably less that, and what I'm what I'm sensing, what we're getting for, you know, uh, reports from, you know, all, all kinds of places, both within these companies and then just in general on the street, talking to, you know, people in in the business, it, it is as you noted, Marco, a perfect storm. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. All right. Well, let's uh, let's finish up with. Um, AMD's Radeon RX 6900 XT, and I'll drop that into the chat now as well, Chris, for you. Um, impressive card, big beast of a card. Um, still shares that that same footprint, triple fan, triple axial fan design of the 6800 XT. So, and, and it's also a little bit thicker, right? But so same cooler design. Uh, but a full complement of 80 compute units, 80 on 880, excuse me, Radeon compute units and 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory. And uh, yeah, clocks are all about the same. Uh, but with those extra Radeon compute units, you get some some more horsepower. Marco, you went through this in detail. Um, 
Nice to see some of the tweaks, uh, adding some lighting control, thankfully. Good to see that. Um, what are your what are your thoughts in general on this card and its value proposition? It's a thousand bucks, but it's five hundred bucks less than a RTX thirty ninety. You know, that's a lot of money. <laughs> How you feel about the sixty nine hundred XT is going to depend on the games that you play, but it's actually the exact same form factor as a sixty eight hundred XT. It's not any thicker. It's it's yep. literally the the exact same card, but with more compute units enabled and with those additional you know additional compute units you get some more uh, texturing performance and the frequency voltage curve is tuned to try to maintain it may, won't maintain max boost but maintain higher clocks overall over the duration and what you end up seeing is in traditional raster it, it literally it trades punches with the 3090 so depending on the title, you could skew the results to all look in AMD's favor or all in NVIDIA's favor. It's really close competition with mm. traditional rasterization. Um, throw ray tracing into the mix, and it's a different story. This is obviously, you know, this is AMD's first-gen ray tracing effort. And it's actually a really, really good first-gen effort. It, this card was beating the 2080 Ti. So had AMD launched before Ampere, AMD yeah. would have had the fastest ray tracing solution, you know, at one point. So it, it does beat the 2080 Ti. It kind of trades blows with a 3070, but it, it does, cannot ray come tracing. close to it with ray tracing. Yeah, um, Cannot come close to a 3080 or a 3090 with ray tracing enabled, period. There's no other way to say it. But overall, like, it's a really, really strong card. It, it's It's not terribly loud. It's not terribly hot. It's Two and a half slot form factor. It's way smaller than a 3090, like yep. way smaller than a 3090. Yep. And I also think that AMD held back a little bit with this card. If you look at the power numbers, it's it's lower power than a 3090. And you, you tick on rage mode, and it ends up catching 3090, a, a little, getting a little closer than 3090 in some tests. Mm. But it also overclocks like crazy. So yeah. I think that AMD probably, and they may do this, and they could have done this, maybe tuned the power curve to, you know, use a couple percentage points more power and, and one more, a few more game benchmarks. But yeah, overall, it's it, it's nip and tuck. <clears throat> We're totally nitpicking. If you're sitting in front of any traditional rasterization game playing it, you are not going to be able to tell. It is that fast. It is a kick-ass top-end, ultra-high-end GPU for 50% less than the competing card. It just doesn't have quite the ray tracing performance. Right, right. Yeah. Interesting uh, note about the overclocking and, and the headroom. And and by the way, I'm not sure if I uh, misspoke, but yeah, identical cooler design understood to the 6800 XT. Um, when you look at the, your overclocking results on page four, um, you can see that like in some games it jumps out, like F1 2020, for example, uh, 4K Ultra it actually is able to jump out in front of a 3090. Um, so, yeah, imp impressive there. Um, you know, and, and, and even in, like, Far Cry New Dawn, these are, these are titles, you know, depending on the game title, you know, certain game engines run better, you know, on, on either or hardware. Uh, Metro Exodus tends to be a little bit more optimized for NVIDIA. It still can't catch a 3090 on Metro Exodus. But, yeah, impressive stuff. Um, but even before, then we're talking four frames a second. Yeah. You're not, yeah, you're not gonna, yeah. you're not gonna pick that up. Not, not, not when you're in the 70 to hundred frames per second range, you're, you're just not. Um, yeah. So 30, uh, excuse me, uh, 6,900 XT OEM cards. What are your thoughts there? Could there be some interesting derivatives brought to market with that? Yes, right. So out of the box, the 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 AMD card, you can bump the power target by fifteen percent, and then you know we we know we know rage mode is in there, right? Mm. If they let OEMs throw beefier coolers on there, and you can still bump the power target fifteen percent, but the base target is five percent higher than this one, it's going to be markedly faster. You know, it's going to be significantly faster. So especially if the coolers are more capable and it maintains even higher clocks over longer durations. So these cards are so dynamic and they're so dependent on environmental conditions and temps and power that 
they can tweak and tune a lot of different ways. And it, it's just tough to predict how it's going to go because it, <clears throat> it all depends how, you know, how much power they want to let a card draw because they, they can do so much more in terms of clocks than the, where they ship at. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Chris, do you want a do you want a thirty eighty? Do you want a six hundred XT? Do you want a thirty ninety? What do you want? Uh, <laughs> any of them. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, because I'm using the Titan XP right now, which is on par ish with a twenty eighty, which is on par with a thirty sixty Ti. So anything north of there would definitely be a welcome improvement. Um, I mean, the sixty nine hundred XT with its form factor is very appealing. Um, I mean, the 3090 is ridiculous power, but also for a ridiculous price, even without the scalpers. So, you know, probably something in the 6800 XT or 2080, or sorry, th uh, 3080 range is probably more where I would be looking. But it's it's so hard to say and, and so hard to choose between. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing occurs to me with the, the um, 6900 XT and, and in general... Uh, the Radeon 6000, uh, Radeon RX 6000 PCB versus NVIDIA's um, design for the 30 series, the RTX 30 series. The PCB on a, a Radeon 6000 card is is your typical, you know, full length, you know, slab of, of uh, you know, FR4 PCB. And... If you look at the RTX 30 series, it's this chopped down, super compressed. I, I like the efficiency, um, you know, to, to, to basically eliminate that waste of, of a printed circuit board in an effort to make room for a, a more exotic cooling solution, really, I think, is, is why they did that. I I'm a little I'm a little put off by the RTX 30 series mid location fan uh, PCI Express excuse me power connector because you know the 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 PCB only comes halfway down the card so they gotta that's where they gotta mount it I would think you could run a just run like a line down to the end of the card and you could you know mount it down there but what are your thoughts on that Marco you look at you look at the comfortable layout of the Radeon RX 6900 XT or 6800 XT for that matter. And, and just a little bit more traditional design. Any, any thoughts between those two? Because to me, it's like, that was a major design choice that NVIDIA made for an exotic cooling solution. Yeah. I don't think in terms of like desktop PCs that it matters much. Maybe you get yeah. some cool ITX form, you know, smaller cards eventually from OEMs for, you know, ITX builds. I don't think it means all that much in the grand scheme of things for desktops, but I think NVIDIA is is looking to the future and potentially maybe trying to come up with a form factor that will translate across many different market segments, not necessarily mobile because they had MXM and, mm -hmm. you know, lots of stuff's getting soldered down <laughs> on the thin and light notebooks. Perhaps they could come up with a single form factor that works in big gaming notebooks and desktops, but I'm thinking more across other market segments where they, if you look at AMD, right, what they did with Ryzen, they developed one die and then an I.O. die, and you see ha what happened, right? They didn't have to maintain all these different dies mm. and different designs. They scaled it up and down, and they're they're rocking right now. It's almost like I maybe NVIDIA's working on a strategy like that, where mm. they have this one smaller design that can then scale across all different segments or many different segments. Uh, I'm mm. completely speculating. I don't know. I'm mm. literally just thinking out loud, but that's what strikes me there. Cause there's, they didn't have to make a small PCB for a desktop PC, you know? Yeah. So there's I, a, a reason that they did it. I, I think they did it. I think they did it for the cooling solution to, to make room for that cooling solution to that, that pass through fan. Um, you know, I, th I think it was a thermal, uh you know approach more so but yeah it's it's it just occurs to me i mean you know i'm looking at it and you know you look at the, the amd card it's very traditional in its design approach it's very traditional it's cooling solution um i you know if if nvidia's power connector was only at the, the back end of the card it'd be like a total home run because i just love that design um but yeah you know here you you look at you look at the you know for me you look at the radeon and it's almost a little old school now it's kind of like eh, you know you get these axial fans you get the 
You know what I mean? Like it's just one big slab of cooler across it. Maybe I'm being critical, but I don't know. But then I look at the PCB itself and it's a comfortable, you can see comfortable routing, probably better signal integrity as a result of that. I don't know. I, I think um, NVIDIA is just like, they just we're going to make the card. We're going to make the card we want to make. We're going to yeah. engineer every millimeter of this thing. Yeah. And perhaps AMD's a little more cognizant of their board partners. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. That's yeah. So, do. do the NVIDIA cards look better in a vertical GPU mount where you can just kind of flip the cable behind and hide it a little better? I haven't gone not, looking not, at not, not really because, like, nah, nah, even, it's even if it's up, in up vertical, yeah. like, it, it would just it would be sticking up right out of the middle of the card. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and then tuck immediately behind it. Yeah, I mean, you could. I guess it, it would just be a little, you know, a little tiny, a little tiny bump right here. But I'm, you know. I'm, I'm being a little OCD, but that's the one thing that just rubs me the wrong way with that design. I love the cooler. I think it's just, it's just a well-designed card. I love the, the elegance of it. But that one power connector is like get out of my way. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's all, it's all good stuff. We got anything in the chat before we sign off? That any questions? Any burning questions from the folks? No burning questions, but lots of uh, lots of interesting stuff. So as we were on, the news broke that the FTC wants to break up Facebook. So that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, we had Oscar Castillo mentioning. You know, when the Radeon Seven came out, he was able to buy one right away. And same with the uh, twenty eighty Ti's, but nothing with this generation. Yeah, like like we said, it's just a perfect storm, Oscar. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, SpaceX had a had a launch, right? What, what, Chris, can you want to you want to give us a report on that? Um, well, I haven't been able to see it myself because uh, I've been running Arcast. But <laughs> report is that it came in hot and something about a fireball. I don't know exactly, uh, but and that's probably what I'll be pulling up uh, during dinner after this cast. So. De Derek Moore just said hard sideways landing. I guess that's not good. Yeah, yeah. ended in boom, <laughs> says uh, Blackhawk. That's unfortunate, but you know, I mean, Elon Musk he he prides himself in um, failing magnificently when it comes to SpaceX stuff. Right. Yeah, failing is learning. That's yes. why I break everything, right? <laughs> yeah, Chris, you're good at that. <laughs> Uh, well, and, and with that, we should probably wish everybody uh, well and bid them adieu and stay safe and all that good stuff. Right, fellas? Any any parting words before we uh, say goodbye? <laughs> I'm going to I just want to read one quick thing. I happened to just switch windows and Facebook opened up. It, there was a, an awesome site. It's still a good site. Remember a site, BitTech? Oh, one yeah. The writer, someone that used to write for BitTech many years ago. Tim? Used to work for us. Yes, Tim. Tim's he just posted guy. on Facebook, Elon Musk just literally belly flopped a giant rocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's I don't funny. think he cares all that much. The guy just. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. Yeah. He's it's probably good for press or whatever. They'll figure it out next time. But yeah, no, he, th th that company blows me away. You know, when they can send a, a, a rocket up retrieve it actually use it again save millions and millions of dollars and then oh by the way we're flying up you know nasa astronauts because you know hey you, you can hitch a ride with us now and you guys couldn't make it happen and you know oh by the way we're gonna we're gonna get the rocket back too <laughs> right if footage of his rocket landings were in a movie 10 years ago we wouldn't believe it yeah we'd be like what that's a spaceship man <laughs> yeah no oh, it's wow. great it's great stuff really cool stuff i admire the guy and all he does um, even when he fails magnificently. <laughs> it's a learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. I do that too. I learned quite a bit myself. Hey, and uh <laughs> with that, we'll uh we'll bid you guys adieu. Uh hit us uh, on the web at hothardware.com, twitter.com slash hot hardware, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids, thumbs up, subscribe, please. Hit the notification bell, very important, let you know when we go live. And because uh, we're not, I mean, we try and be here every Wednesday at 530, but sometimes work gets in the way. Uh, we would like to have fun with you every Wednesday at 530. Usually that's 90% of the time what we do. Um, and uh, anything else to add to that, Marco? Did I miss anything? No, I mean, keep, there is so much going on. Keep an eye on the site. Like we have some really cool stuff in the works and the hardware is a flowing and we're coming up on CES season. So, yeah, just keep coming by the site.
<laughs> and actually, yeah, I should say, keep, keep coming by the site because we've got uh, a couple of giveaways coming up too. So um, we're going to be giving away some um, Ryzen goodness, some Ryzen 5000 series goodness, okay, Zen 3, um, with some exotic cooling to go with it. Uh, not a system, just some component stuff. Um, I think we're going to do some uh, video capture and streaming equipment giveaways as well, maybe with our friends at EVGA. So we have toys for good good girls and boys uh, to be given away shortly. Yes, sir. At hothower.com. Yeah. So, uh, and with that, um, we will thank you so much for stopping by. Take care. Be safe. And we'll see you soon.